Wars, climate change, finance and famine dominate the news. Every day we hear from the heroes, the villains and the victims. But people on the edge of the news have stories too. People like filmmaker Charles Stewart and the friends he's made in difficult times in Ethiopia. Meet Charles Stewart, biker and filmmaker. It's a thrill, a thrill. It's not a good feeling, it's a thrill. And yeah, I don't think you can define why a thrill is a thrill. It's just a thrill. Like filming, I mean, filming's a thrill as well. You just get behind the lens and the eye through and the composition and the thing working and um, it's just... There's nothing as thrilling as being behind the camera, not even behind being on a motorcycle. And... Um, you're searching for moments of truth, and moments of truth are magic, and only film gives moments of truth. In 1984, something happened which changed Charles's life. Making a film in the Ethiopian highlands about desertification he was filming one morning in a health clinic. And this boy came in and he had a great open wound on his neck like that. He and his father had walked from Coram and that was a four day walk for them. They said they'd come from Coram and Coram was a terrible place, a place of famine, a place of disaster. There was thousands of people there and there was no food. And they said there is famine up there. Nobody had mentioned this before, so that was the instant that we realised uh, that ten years after the famine of 70, as early 70s, Ethiopia was back in the same situation. Charles Stewart is the filmmaker whose images first alerted the world to the famine in Coram. It was the biblical famine which caused hundreds of thousands of deaths. It was the famine which led to the Live Aid concerts. Some of the worst babies, they were just rejecting out of hand because they said, Dad, that baby's dead, it will never survive. Uh, too late, too late, too late, too late, we'll take that. And, um, that's a terrible thing. Terrible, terrible thing. My poor people making the decisions. Had you filmed anything like that before? Um, nothing like that, no. Famine, there's nothing, there's, there is nothing like famine. There is nothing like it. Charles did not come out of the famine unscathed. What effect did it have on, on you? I don't know. Uh, I think it's a burden you carry all your life. It harms you, damages you. I'm damaged. How do you mean? Yeah. Well, seeing people that are dying and seeing people, family people you know will be dead within hours and seeing people that will uh, die with days and if there was proper medicine, if there was, they would live. If there was food, they would live. They're dying because we don't care enough. We don't care. <laughs> Over the years, Charles Stewart has carried on filming in Ethiopia, in bad times and good. This year, with his partner Pat, he returned again. Now 72, he wanted to revisit the main characters in his films, if he could find them. Charles 
so we're going on a journey around Ethiopia. The idea is to go and find all the people that we've been filming over the last 25 years and to do a summing up of what we've seen during that period of time. We went using our own money and uh, so we weren't looking to hire a 4x4 or even a small car, or even a motorcycle. So we went on public transport. When we were traveling, we did 30 journeys in 30 days. Uh, and we traveled like ordinary Ethiopians travel, on the bus, on it. All right, it's hard. The seats are hard. <laughs> Sometimes they're very hard. <laughs> and the buses break down. And you wait for a bus a day, you don't mind. In 2007, Charles had filmed an aid program in the Maquette region. 42,000 hungry people received cash in return for community work. The program was funded by the Dutch government and implemented on the ground by Save the Children. Among those who benefited were Debru and his wife Asimu. Their five-year-old son, Bayou, was permanently stunted by malnutrition. They hoped the scheme would stop the same thing happening to eight-month-old Mickey Ray. I have entered the cash program this year and I got money to buy food, clothing and seed to plant. From that seed, I'm harvesting and I'm now eating the food I produced. So I can say that I have benefited. Charles had learned the Dutch government had stopped funding the program. And he and Pat were anxious to find out how Debru and Asamu were doing. I'm very, very pleased to see them both again and that their children are fine. I know Sam would look just exactly the same as she did before. And she was in the same dress. I mean, she, she's not rich enough to have two dresses in two years. <laughs> but now Asamu was even less well off than before. <laughs> we have been sailing and eating our property. We have digested it. What happened to the Save the Children? They don't come anymore. When did they stop? You came in March that year, and they stopped in October. Two years after Charles's last visit, and Bayou's improved, helped by the cash transfer scheme. But now the scheme's donor, the Dutch government, had switched its funding to the Ethiopian government's program to help those without enough food. Cash from the Ethiopian program had yet to reach Asamu and Debru or their community. They were much better, looking much better, looking much better fed, but there was there were lots of worry on, and particularly Debru looked well, looked a worried man. We borrowed 935 birds. To repay, I had to sell six sheep, and we have used what we saved. But that isn't enough. When the cash stopped, we weren't able to buy clothes or food. With no seed or ox, we gave our land for crop share. So now we struggle for survival. The family had, were in debt, gro gravely in debt, to the tune of, uh, it doesn't mean anything but the tune of a, they're in debt to about three quarters of an ox. Uh, and um, that's a serious debt. And uh, uh, you could say, well, how will they ever pay it, repay it? And I couldn't see how they'd ever repay it. How they got into debt? I'm borrowing for to buy food. Borrowing to buy, buy food. That's how most people get into debt. We said we'd either pay their debt or buy them an ox. 
and they, they said they'd like an ox. So we brought them an ox. Asamu is now pregnant with her third child. They'll need children to run the farm in the future. But it's a future that's still uncertain. These kids of mine, they're very small. Kids are an asset, but it's not wise to suppose these two will survive. Safe had pulled out. So these people were all disenfranchised. They didn't know what was happening. The day just for them stopped like that. The Ethiopian government aims to cover all Maket with its safety net program. And some areas are receiving emergency food aid from abroad. But Charles left Asamu and Debru with serious concerns. The scheme had done a lot of good, and it has kept them going for three years, three and a half years, nearly. Um, but uh, what happens to those people now? Back on the bus. Our travellers are off to see one of the leaders they'd interviewed in the 84 famine. Their destination, Anseta, one deep ravine away and a 70-kilometre ride round it. Charles has been filming here for 25 years. Anseta's changed. More houses, twice as many people. In 1984, Kesengede chaired the Farmers' Association in Anseta. Anseta was at the edge of the famine area. In that social government, uh, he was responsible for the people. I got some credit from Angeda for um, the fact that they got food. At Sunday worship, Kes Angeda breaks bread for his congregation. Now 73, a year older than Charles, he's a senior priest. After the service, he tells Charles 1984 could be about to happen again. We are used to good times and we are used to bad times. But today, for me as well as for everyone else here, it's a bad time. This year, the drought is at its worst. This is same as in 1984, the crops dried up. Some have food until July, some have already used all their food. Charles had known Kesengeda and his seven children for a quarter of a century. He'd lived in his house, shared his food, played with his children and gone to church with him. In 1984, you came and asked me what was happening, and I explained that people were dying. People didn't have food or seed. We shouted, and aid came. It was you who intervened and told the authorities, and that is how we survived. Ethiopian officials told Charles they believed aid would come again. But the stakes are high. Everyone still fears crop failures like those of 84. Yes, well, they said the rains had partially failed, that the crop was very poor, so they get half a crop or three quarters of a crop. And what matter, well, now they're in this position, in, they say it's as bad as in 1984, what they are absolutely relying on is the rains that are coming in July. And if these are not good, then there will be a disaster, another disaster. Many people in the drought-prone highlands have resettled over the last two decades. Time to catch up. So we left Ansetta, where we've been filming since 1984. One of the people we'd started filming in 1984 left and went to resettle. His name was Atluk. Charles had filmed Akluk at the height of the famine when Akluk was 18. Akluk left his home in Gaiant looking for a better life elsewhere in Ethiopia. 17 years later, in 2002, Charles tried to track him down. I can see somebody sitting there. 
We went on another journey, a major journey, to find Atla. We had no idea where he was, and we were hunting for him. And we had some clues as to where he was, and it took us uh, round all over, uh, around a certain part of Ethiopia in the south, and we eventually found him. It's very good. <laughs> Hello. And when we walked up to him, he couldn't believe it. He thought I was dead, because he'd heard I was ill, and he thought I was dead. So he, he, he was first. <gasps> <laughs> but where is famine survivor Aklok now? Armed with camera and bus fares, Charles and Pat are back on the hunt again. So we're first on. We're the very first on. We've chosen our seats. A full day travel. Hopefully without a two and a half hour breakdown. It's yes, three days on the bus. Uh, we went down the Nile Gorge uh, and up the other side. Um, of course, the buses take a terrible hammering. On. <laughs> so do the people in them. <laughs> Charles and Pat found Akluk farming the land he'd cleared seven years back. Last time they'd met, Charles and Pat had given him some money. But he'd used it all up, and not in the way intended. Yes, you gave me money to buy an ox, farm tools, and some seeds. I bought an ox and a donkey with the money, also seeds and tools. But after you left, we were told that we had illegally cut down the forest for land. The court sentenced me to up to 18 months imprisonment or a fine. In fact, I spent two months in prison and paid a fine. So all you gave me was sold to pay the fine. Then I was free. Free, farming, and still clearing the land to feed his growing family. It's a struggle. Poor nutrition has left his wife with a goiter. And there's continuing conflict with the locals, the Gumas people. Yes, first of all, they say that in the past, they used to get honey from the forest. They say the forest is becoming dry unless you go away there will not be any forest. They say we are plowing it up. They don't like us plowing, so they start trouble. They want the forest and their honey, but we, because my old home is dried up, we have no other place. We want to farm here. You see, if you can't plow, we can't survive. So we are very afraid of these people, and we keep quiet. Atla was very, very angry, because Atla wants to get the hell out of that place as quickly as he can, because he fears for his life, and he fears for the life of his children. In February, Charles donated his filming rushes to the Ethiopian government. So he told Akluk he had the honor of being in the National Archive. Charles didn't get the reaction he expected. He wasn't happy about that at all. In fact, he was incensed. He was really angry. He was saying, here am I, feeling at risk for my life and the life of my family, living on absolutely on the edge of existence, thinking I, we will be killed. And there is my image and my life in the National Archive. It is intolerable. And then he started, and then he swing, swung his attack onto me, to, and you've been living on me as well, and here am I with nothing. And of course he's perfectly right, perfectly correct. <laughs> so we, f we set up to film him in the morning, and we're trying to hold on to the anger that he had, but it had gone. He was sorry. And we got a bit of it, we didn't get that anger. The anger, he'd blown the anger out of himself. 
ለኔ ክብሩ ግን ሚስተር ቻርልስ ትላንተ ማታ አስ ሚስተር ቻርልስ ሴድ ላስት ናይት አይ ወርክድ ፎር ዘ አርካይ ዘ ማኒ ኢዝ ፊኒሽድ ባት ኢት ኢዝ አ ፕሪቪሌጅ ቱ ወርክ ዊዝ ዘ ፎሬነርስ and the people see this even if i have no money i have this honor and it is my pride and the honor will last into the future life is very hard loneliness the situation today the money without support a man cannot hang on to life and grow but i don't expect change life is becoming hard and incredibly terrifying i i felt very humbled by what that took said i agreed with him we had no right to to benefit in this way without him benefiting over the time of no i've given him five bucks and that is some help but it's not enough help to transform him but problem with a documentary filmmaker like me is you don't uh, you you need to help people and it's only right that you help people and you give people substantial help but you don't grab them and change their lives so how did you feel about the whole trip at the end you come back very sad very chastened very humble and um It seems to me that Ethiopia has got poorer. But for good to Addis and all the towns are bustling. So there's an explosion in the place and there's energy you can feel the energy but there isn't in the countryside has been just left behind and suffering suffering suffering. So this this explosion in energy and wealth is not touching the people in the country as far as I can see. 10 million of them are still needing aid. food 10 million people in Ethiopia are not producing enough food to feed themselves back in britain time to visit save the children in london charles wanted to know about the cash transfer scheme in maket and why it had stopped okay. Thank you. i remember that this program was working with uh, 42000 beneficiaries spread across our district the challenge in this particular program was to support provide cash benefits to families to help them improve their livelihoods. We tried to secure additional funding from donors uh, to continue our work in this community. We were unsuccessful in getting that additional funding. Uh, as a charity we rely on donors to provide that assistance. Uh, and so that that program came to an end. Uh, we did during the course of the 5 years work with the government of Ethiopia in helping them set up their uh their social protection program uh but again that there were not enough resources to reach every family Charles is now back home in Gloucestershire's forest of Dean What gives you a kick is the speed and the road that's just there the road is just passing you by and you're very vulnerable as we're vulnerable in Ethiopia we manage by cuz people that allow us and accept us and don't hurt us but we must be least seem like millionaires to people in Ethiopia who come there see some stuff go away go to our own food and our own soft easy lives come back to Gloucestershire come back to Gloucestershire where it's green grapes are growing <laughs> tomatoes are growing <laughs> it's an easy life whereas the people in Ethiopia have a very very hard life when your children are going to bed hungry that must be a terrible thing and when you see your children stunted and running nose and eyes watering because they have not got proper nutrition that's bad that's terrible that is on the edge that is on the edge I'm Charles Stewart. I'm a filmmaker. I've been making films since 1965. Been filming in Ethiopia since 1984.
by accident. I happened to be there when there was a famine. I happened to record it.